Switch to James Fisher. Next we have Martin Baker with a bit of non-fiction. Um, Martin Baker, or call me Marty, was born in <laughs> Liverpool in 1961. He settled in the northeast of England almost 30 years ago. I think that's impressive enough, yes. really, isn't it? <laughs> An assist trained mental health first aider and member of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, Mind and Bipolar UK, is passionate about raising awareness of mental health issues. With co author Fran Houston, Martin has written a non fiction titled Gum on My Shoe One Step at a Time with My Bipolar Best Friend. His work, Collected Poems, 1977 to 1984, was published in 2008. And Playing a Darkness, a novella set in and around Tynemouth Priory and Castle, is currently unpublished. Here's Martin Baker. I'm going to start with a short poem by Fran on her best friend and co-author. Um, Fran lives in the States and we've been friends, best friends for five years. She lives with bipolar disorder, uh, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and the book is about our relationship <coughs> with her, my support and her support of her despite the fact that we live 3,000 miles apart. I woke up by Fran Houston. I woke up choking and coughing could not breathe. It frightened me. I called my UK poet friend. He calmed me. He calmed my crisis. Thank God for the ocean of technology. Though it be virtual, it be real to me. And the water of word means the world to me. Now I'm going to read, going to read from uh, chapter 9 of our book, which is talking about um, time in 2013, and Fran and her parents were touring Europe, and I was doing my best to support her from here in New York. When things are at their worst, we focus on three basic principles, trust, challenge, and self-care. I couldn't support Fran at all if she didn't want and trust me to do so. She trusts me not to hide or run away, and to hold a space in which she feels safe, no matter how perilous her thoughts feelings and experiences might be. She also trusts me to deal with my own issues so she can focus on meeting her needs. We share a belief that even the most difficult experiences can yield rewards if we remain open to exploring them. The three months Fran spent in Europe were an immense challenge to her health and stability, yet she believed there was value to be gained from the experience. It could be argued she put her health, indeed her life, in danger by refusing to abandon the trip. And there were times I certainly argued for her to return home, but it was her, her choice to make. I would have supported her in any case. Stubborn persistence is part of Fran's makeup. Without it, she would not be who she is. She, very probably, she would not be alive today. Extreme self-care becomes our guiding motto when things are really rough. We set minor matters aside and focus on whatever will best support her through the immediate crisis. Fran's wellness plan is invel invaluable at such times, as is our joint commitment to involving others when necessary. Paying close attention to my own health and well-being is no less important and allows me to support her when she needs me most. The Queen Mary II took two days to reach Hamburg from Southampton. Fran's final text message to me from the ship acknowledged the challenges that lay ahead, but looked forward with acceptance and hope. Tomorrow, I'll very much need your hand and heart, Martin. We have many hoops to jump through. Disembarking, taxi, rental car, and the journey south. Whatever will be, will be. I will stay centered and calm and graceful. They collected the rental car and drove to stay with relatives in hard exile. Fran settled in well. She was able to be herself and found her, people responding positively towards her. It was a joy for me to see her building on old relationships and developing new ones. Her relatives had Wi-Fi, which meant we could talk whenever we wanted, Skype. 
but it was impossible to connect our parents' laptop to the internet, and it remained unused for the rest of the trip. It was a three-month trip. Little of it had been planned in advance. The responsibility for researching routes and accommodation fell to Fran, but without the laptop, she could only access the internet on her phone. I helped as much as I could, but the stress soon began to affect her energy and mood. It was hard for her to maintain the healthy habits she relied on at home. Most significantly, she had very little privacy, physical space, or opportunity to meditate and rest. She slept poorly and developed a heavy cold. Things didn't improve on a five-day trip they took to the Baltic coast. There was no Wi-Fi in the apartment, and Fran's mobile wireless device failed to support our voice calls. Within four days, she'd used almost all her data allowance for the month. There were some bright moments, but her mood began to deteriorate sharply. <coughs> My diary records that her mental health was starting to concern me, as was the suggestion she was using alcohol as part of her coping strategy. Fran's drunk quite a lot tonight, I wrote. As a one-off, that's fine, it might help her. There's one more thing for us to keep an eye on, on top of some pretty unhealthy suicidal thinking. Two days later, I'd added mania to my list of concerns. When Fran and I spoke this morning, there was a distinct edge of mania in her voice and manner of speaking, although she had also been drinking. She seemed calmer later on, so I'm not really sure how she is. I was honest with her though, and said I am detecting a manic edge. She rarely felt she was coping well, and I did what I could to reassure and encourage her. Whenever she told me something the slightest bit positive or hopeful, I added it to a good moments list and emailed it to her, so she had something to refer back to when things were especially hard. I also struggled at times, especially early in the trip like this, when we were coming to terms with the situation. We had a good phone call tonight, I wrote in my diary. Fran offloaded about her day. I think it helped her to let go of the tension she was feeling. I wanted her to appreciate the things she's got right this past week, because she's done so well. Afterwards, she messaged me. I'm glad we got to talk properly. I took the opportunity to mention that we've not had a chance to talk about my end of things. I'd shared a few things about what I'd been doing, but not about what I was feeling. She said she's been really stressed and under pressure and tired most of the time. I understand that. I don't need anything to change as such, but it helped that I got to say how I was feeling. It was exactly what we needed. I sent you an email, surprise, surprise. With those words, Fran broke the news to me that the lease on her home that she'd rented for seven years wasn't going to be renewed when it expired at the end of October. This just came through, Fran? Yeah, it really sucks. Where am I going to go? I don't know. My first thought is, you may need to return home, otherwise you're going to have next to zero time to find somewhere else to live. I'm pretty numb right now. I know. You really need, do deserve a break. I've worked so hard to have stability and support in my life. Fran, it's because you've worked so hard that you're here at all. And I don't just mean here in Germany, I mean here at all, <coughs> alive at all. I want to tell you you're not alone, but I know that's going to ring pretty hollow right now. Hey, you could go live with your mum. Fuck you. <laughs> that's not even a joke. <coughs> Actually, once over the initial shock, Fran handled things really calmly and efficiently. Within a day, she'd spoken to friends back home and exchanged emails with her care coordinator and the housing agency. I was surprised and proud at how proactive she was given all that was going on. She did precisely what was needed and deferred any decision about returning home earlier than planned. They spent the next two and a half weeks in Austria. The hotel there had Wi-Fi, so we were able to talk, but it was difficult to synchronize our schedules. We rarely managed more than 15 minutes or so at a time, and went days without talking at all. About this time, she began talking about managing more on her own. 
although hard for me to hear, this was a healthy and necessary impulse. Writing in my diary one evening, I recalled a favorite saying of ours, give people what they need, not what you need to give them. Fran has so much going on right now, I wrote to my diary. I need to be here for her, but not push too hard or lay my own stuff on her too heavily. Now really isn't the time with only chat and intermittent phone calls. I want to be the, fra the friend she needs me to be. We were learning parallel lessons about friendship, support, and codependency. Fran needed to focus on her own situation. This in no way relieved me of my responsibility to help where I could, but she needed me to trust, to trust her, to trust myself, and to trust the two of us to handle whatever arose. Austria provided a degree of stability, but Fran appeared to be adapting to being with her parents all the time after living for years on her own. Her most cherished moment of the summer came when she and her mom lay down on a bed of wildflowers in the Austrian Alps. Today was a duel, she must have twinkled. It's what I came for. Few words exchanged, but the magnitude of the outside matched the inside. I believe we can continue staying in a better place. She also took encouragement from being able to strike up meaningful relationships with people she met. Nevertheless, she was still struggling. Her normal coping strategies were founded on rest, personal space, and moderation in both eating and drinking. These were all difficult to maintain when she was rarely out of her parents' company. She'd later find the strength to demand personal space, but at this stage in the trip, she was with them almost on all, this, all the excursions and outings. To survive, she returned to the unhealthy coping strategies of the past. She overindulged with food and was drinking as a means of getting through the day. It was hard for me to witness. 64.9 kilos. Is that your weight, Fran? Hang on. That's 153 pounds. Ouch. Fuck, that's about a 10 pound gain in six weeks. But it's no surprise. I'm using food and drink to numb all this fucking pain and stress. I was okay at first, but I'm losing ground, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Can you contemplate changing that? Even small changes? If so, I'll do all I can to support you. If not, and that's okay too, do what you need to do. And I'll be here with you through it and afterwards. I really don't think I'd be doing so well if I didn't have alcohol to soften the blows. I probably would have flown home already. I understand, Fran. I don't have to like it, but you don't have to justify yourself to me. I'm medicating myself. No, Fran, no, you're not. It's not medication. It's something to help you get through what's happening, and that's okay, but we need to be clear about what's happening here. Do you want me to help you monitor your drinking? I'm gonna ask you why you are putting yourself through all this when there's seven weeks left to go. If it's so bad now, you need to do all these unhealthy things just to get through it. When else am I going to get to do a trip like this? Yes, it's fucking hard. I'm doing things I rather wouldn't. It's not comfortable like I'd want, but I will stay the course. And no, you don't get to monitor my drinking. Okay, Fran, this is as real as it gets. I need you to know that I'm in your corner, fighting along with you, not against you. It rips me to pieces to see you hurting like this, but I understand you need to be here. I'll fight to the last to keep you from hurting yourself, but I can't take away what's going on, and I need to let you do what you need to do. Thanks, Martin. I couldn't do any of this without you. Thank you. And um, we've got the open mic section now.